So, uh, a couple of warnings in advance of this talk. Uh, the first is that I can't draw. Um, so, I spent quite a long time preparing for this. Uh, uh, recently I've been on both sides of the table interviewing and so every time I was kind of giving an interview or being interviewed I was thinking what could I say that's interesting about this in my presentation so I made a lot of really good factual dry notes in bullet lists um, and then I thought what would be really cool is if I did something unique and quirky and really twisted this up and everybody would be amazed at my slide deck uh, so I thought I've got a tablet I'll hand draw illustrations of me doing cool stuff um, and then I don't know, two or three slides into this, it became apparent just how poorly I draw. Um, so forgive that the drawings tend to come and go as and when I thought that I couldn't do without them. Um, and the other thing is that I've decided to consciously uncouple myself from grammar and formatting in that I looked at it and I'm a pedant for bullet points that have full stops on the ends and ones that don't and consistency and I just couldn't make it line up to be consistent so in the end I just went let's just lean into inconsistency so you'll see that there's a myriad of styles and flavours come through it's quite eclectic um, and yeah I suppose the other apology here is that you're stuck with me um, but I'm hoping it'll be okay because it's comparatively difficult to talk about a hiring manager's perspective on recruitment without then offering advice for candidates as to how they can help make me happy and that kind of thing so um, I've considered it a bit from both sides so um, by way of a rough agenda I'll tell you a little bit about me um, I'll talk about how I've come to feel about recruitment over the last few years um, what I look for in candidates and what I do to actually look for it um, and give you some tips on how you can impress me so um, I started off, I was a software developer, I did computer science at university, I became a software developer, I did that for a few years, I became a consultant. Um, after my consultancy, I moved back to being a hands-on developer and then into leading teams of developers. I'm not that old and it makes it sound like I've done a lot. Um, but more recently I've been focusing on pure management of development teams um, and most recently I've been head of development at Gladstone Software in uh, Wallingford and then GigaClear in Abingdon um, and just in the last couple of days I've started over at Strongbyte in uh, Battle by Burford, Shipton under Witchwood um, and really in the last sort of five years my roles have really been about recruiting people um, as a consultant as a developer I was involved from a technical perspective and screening candidates and making sure that they cut the mustard um, but it's only really been the last sort of five years that I've been in a kind of decision making perspective um, and I thought that I should try and pull stuff together into a theme and my themes are that I've become both cautious and hopeful that's kind of my mindset on recruitment now so in terms of caution here we go um, I thought what would be amazing would be to do a really sort of detailed secondary analysis of all of the stuff people have said about the importance of good teams. Um, but when you get to it, you just end up with what are essentially motivational posters with glib quotes underneath them. And I thought I could do better, I could do them of myself. My wife said this looks like swimming, but this is me winning a race. I'm in the lead and I'm saying our people are our greatest assets. Uh, here I am jumping the highest high jump, I'm winning at that. Um, and then that's me staring blissfully into the sunset on a desert island. Um, so suffice to say that, that it's well established at this point that building a good team is pretty important to your company. Um, a lot of people say you build your team first and the product comes later um, and all of these awesome quotes about it. Um, I decided that I wasn't going to dwell on that a lot and just kind of take it as accepted that it's important to have good people in your team. Um, the second thing that makes me cautious is the time it takes. Um, so this is kind of building um, on the statistics earlier. So um, out of 275 people that I got CVs for last year, um, 186 of them kind of went somewhere. The rest of them, just something happened. They just went missing. They wouldn't respond to people. Um, they uh, decided to, um, what are the cases? There's things like, um, some of them would still have been in process at the point these statistics were taken. Um, some of them um, would have been opted out for completely, you know, legal reasons and all that kind of stuff. But it's a surprisingly large percentage that don't even get to me looking at their CV. Or if I've looked at their CV, it didn't matter because they can't do it anyway. Um, of the 189 CVs that I actually reviewed and progressed, um, 99 of those went forward. So you're losing over 40% actually just on reading the CV, which... Um, when I come back and look at the statistics in sort of, you know, cold hard light of day, it's quite a lot. Um, I was quite surprised at how ruthless I am when I come to reviewing CVs. Um, then I give people a phone call and that takes it down to 57, so that's, you know, another 30% gone. 
Um, and then face to face, um, apparently I'm better than most actually, only about three to one in terms of the people that I offer to by the time I get to face to face. Um, and then I don't know, 40% of the people that I offer to reject me, which is staggering because I'm amazing. Um, but out of that 275 people, we ended up with 13, and I was like super happy about it. Um, but what you can see is that this all takes time. You know, to review a CV properly, you've got to an hour, an hour of your time, something like that. A um, bit more if you want to be really thorough and go and cyber stalk them and read through their GitHub repository and all of that kind of stuff. Um, doing a phone interview, you know, you're looking at two people for half an hour plus a bit of prep time plus a bit of discussion time afterwards. Um, face to face, depending on the kind of format of your face to face. Um, a lot of ours ran for two, two and a half hours. Again, a couple of people, a bit of prep, a bit of time afterwards. Um, it's a very expensive thing for a company to do. Um, and then there's the most important thing, which is that as a hiring manager, building a good, strong team is kind of my job. Um, and if I end up recruiting people that are really rubbish, then everybody looks at me like I can't do my job properly, um, which is very upsetting for me. So I end up with this fear kind of loitering under the surface that I'm going to do a bad job, that everybody's going to see me for the charlatan that I am and that I'm a fraud. And, you know, so there's a lot of sort of pressure on you as a hiring manager to do a good job. To, and you can't underestimate the importance to a candidate, right? It's people's lives, it's their livelihood, their children, their family, whether they can support them, whether they can send their kid on pony camp, whatever it is, it's um, real people's lives. And you're making quite big decisions about it. So it can be quite daunting to be on the um, hiring manager side of the table. So I came up with a rule, um, which is really simple. And it just says, if it's not a yes, it's a no, um, which I, I was quite pleased with it. But what I'm saying is getting to the end of an interview is actually quite easy to tell whether the right person or not, because you go, yeah. And it makes it feel like it should be, yeah, come on, he's awesome. But it's really not that. It's just there's no reason I can see why I wouldn't hire this candidate. I think he's competent. He could do the job. Why not? You know, yeah, let's do that. Um, and what we find a lot of the time is it's really difficult to live by such a simple rule because what happens is people get in your ear and they go, well, he wasn't that bad, was he? You know, if you gave him some support and brought him along, you might be able to do the job. Um, or have you thought that you could change something slightly and you might fit in? Or there's always the probation period. You could give him a go. And if you don't like him, you could get rid of him. Um, and you almost end up with these whispers in your ears thinking maybe I should take a punt and have a go and um, invariably the instances when I've listened to people who said that it's turned out to be wrong and um, they haven't stuck it out in the business anyway so just going with your gut and saying if I'm not set and 100% satisfied this is the right person then I'm just not doing it um, and I tend to try and live by that as best I can now I thought it'd be helpful to talk about um, the things I actually look for in candidates. Um, the thing about this is it's really subjective, right? This is kind of my list. Um, employer to employer, it's going to vary quite a lot. Um, but for me, the most important thing is team fit, because um, I look to build really nice, happy, motivated teams that are engaged. Um, and you kind of think of it like the Garden of Eden, and you don't want to introduce the snake into it and mess it all up. Um, so I really view getting the right person that's going to fit with the rest of the team, gel with the rest of the team, work well with the rest of the team as being the most important aspect. Um, obviously, there's technical competency. You've normally got a job that needs doing and you need somebody who can actually do that job. Um, I look for flexibility because um, I'm quite a sort of proponent of agile and I'm all about getting stuff done. Um, and I don't want things to get in the way of getting stuff done. And if that means that, sorry, Mr. Developer, you've got to go and test the story for now because it needs to get done, um, then I look for people who are going to be up for that. Um, and that's not to say that I expect people to work outside of their roles for a long period of time or that I'm trying to sort of mess around. Um, it's just that I want people who are just going to dig in and get the job done and be pragmatic about the work that's assigned to them. Um, I put passion in quote marks because um, it's a very sort of divisive word. A lot of people hate it. A lot of people love it. I'm kind of indifferent in the absence of anything better. Um, but what I look for is somebody who's actually engaged, actually loves technology, actually wants to write good software, build good stuff, you know, um, do better than the average. Um, and you can normally tell quite quickly when you're speaking to someone whether development or um, testing, you know, it's just a career for them and they really don't care about it. Um, or the people that really do vibe on it and enjoy it and you get the impression that they're really going to um, dig in and work well for you and enjoy what they're doing and feed into that kind of positive team dynamic. Um, and then I put diversity, which again is kind of, I suppose, equally um, divisive. But 
and I don't necessarily mean diversity in the sense of let's do positive discrimination and make sure that one in three women or one in three developers are women. You know, I mean that um, I want people with mixed experience in my teams because I think they make better product. So I want people who are good at the front end. I want people who are good at the back end. I want people who've lived in different countries and seen different cultures and understand different ways of working. And you know, a lot of fresh ideas that could be brought to the table just by having a mix of people in your team. Um, so I, I tend to consider that if I can. Then I move on to why I'm hopeful about recruiting. Um, so the reason you recruit in the first place is because you want to go better, faster, stronger. You want to do things that you're not able to do at the moment. You want to do things um, that you know, you've know you been putting off for years on end and you can suddenly do them because you've got extra people to do them. Um, or it's taking the pain away. So. Um, particularly recently, you know, I've been in a situation where I've been doing my job and another person's job and another person's job, and I just want somebody to come and do those jobs for me so that I don't have to do them anymore. Um, and I've put this kind of double here, because of course it is, because not only do I have not have the person who I want to do that job, but I'm also spending all my time recruiting to try and find the person to do that job. And so then when you find that person, they go and do the job, and I don't have to recruit anymore, plus they're doing the job, and my life becomes much easier. Um, so you tend to start feeling this kind of pressure um, sorry, it's deliberately faint. I sort of, it's designed to be menacing. Um, so there's sort of pressure building inside you that you've got to fill the role, you've got to fill the role because it's really important and you're wasting loads of time on it and why have you not filled it yet? And, you know, re recruiters, bless them, are lovely at making you feel like dirt for rejecting all their candidates all of the time. Um, but I'm trying my best. I want to like people. Um, and then, yeah, most importantly, my bonus. You know, I'm incentivized on whether I fill vacancies or not. So if I keep on saying no to people, I get less money, um, which I'm not convinced is a brilliant way of incentivizing a hiring manager, but it's certainly been the reality in a number of companies I've worked at. Um, so believe me, I really want to fill the roles that I've got. I'm very hopeful that I'm going to do it. Um, I really want to say yes. So key to getting hired is just do not give me a reason to not say yes. Um, I was really pleased with that because it kind of has a rhythm to it. Um, so all I'm looking for is that I'm going to set out this wonderful, complicated task of um, challenges in front of you and you just need to not stuff up and then I'll give you a job. Um, it's one of those things, it's kind of like a, I mentally vision it as like a um, narrow rope bridge over a canyon or something where you just have to put one foot in front of the other and walk but then there's all the pressure and all the stuff going on that confuses you. Um, but it should be easy, you just need to show that you can do a good job and I'll give you a job. Um, and I've just got to put a hint up front here which is that the internet has loads of really good stuff on it. I've been looking at it quite a lot, there's tons of it. Um, and actually in terms of recruitment, most of the answers are on the internet and if you just read it, you'll be okay. Um, and most of the things that I'll talk about they're not rocket science and they're not groundbreaking and it's been done to death um, but it's just phenomenal the number of candidates you see that just don't do it that haven't considered it that clearly haven't right <laughs> so CVs what am I up to um, I'm trying to build a mental picture um, so all I've got is a piece of paper that tells me about you and all I'm trying to do is look at that piece of paper and go I get who you are I know what you can bring to my team I know the experience you've got um, and I go down and I sort of mentally um, think about how many of the boxes that I've got in my job spec can you tick? Can you do it all? If you can't do it all, do I believe that within a short enough period of time you could grow into doing it? Are the gaps acceptable? Um, and then I'm a bit worried about, is this logical for you? Does it make sense in terms of your journey? Is this a good step for you? Are you going to be motivated? Are you going to be engaged? Are you going to want to do this for the next 18 months, two years? Um, and you can help me do that. So one thing, again, this is like 101 for CVs, two to three pages. Um, I've seen 19 page CVs. Um, and if you think that I have the time to sit and read 19 pages, uh, then you're sadly mistaken. So what that leads to is one, me just saying no, um, which I'm prone to do on occasion. Two, me going back to the recruiter and saying, please, can you get this person to sort their CV out? Um, and by the way, don't think highly of the recruiter for sending it to me in the first place. Um, or number three, uh, read the first page and go, yeah, well, this guy clearly doesn't have an idea anyway, look all this, and then just toss it away. So just keep it succinct um, and think about the things that are relevant to this role. 
Um, so you find a lot that people with background um, in different industries think it's very valuable to tell you all about them. Um, and I love catering. I watch like Restaurant Impossible every night, um, but its applicability to your position as a software tester is limited. Um, so you could say that you do it because I'm building a mental picture and I value the experience you've got and your diversity, um, but I really don't need three pages on it. Um, and I've had people who have put the clubs they were in at university 35 years ago. And it's like, at a point you have to let it go. You have to think about what's new and interesting in your life now that you can tell me about, not what was there. Um, I'm quite keen on this one, about proactively explaining gaps. So, I just want to know what you've been up to. Um, and you find that a lot with women, there'll be a gap and you think, well, she probably had children, but it doesn't say that she had children. Um, and, you know, I don't need to know that you had children, I'm just interested in it. I just want to know where you've been and what you've done. Um, you find it a lot with people that have travelled. Um, it's very difficult from their CV to understand, you know, you've done 10 jobs, which of those were in the UK and which of them were in France, which of them were in India. And I just want to be able to sort of paint that picture of, um, you know, I was born in India, I did university there, then I moved to France, and then I met my wife who was based in the UK, and I went over there to be with her and the kids, and, you know, and I just go, oh, okay, I get you, I know what you're about, I know why you're here. Um, whereas when you just get like a cold list of, you know, company, position, and then the stuff that you did, um, it's really difficult for me to kind of work out what's gone on there. Um, and my, I just feel like my mental picture of you is kind of blurry and I don't really know what I'm working with. Um, simple, clean, accurate. So again, I've got a lot of CVs, I just need to get to the nuts and bolts of them. So if you've said something once, that's probably enough. You don't need to repeat it in every job that you've done the same thing. Um, Try not to use fancy language because I probably won't understand it. I'm not that smart. Just say really plainly what you've done, what you're good at, what you want to do. Um, what you want to do is something that a lot of people miss off their CVs. So um, a lot of the good stuff on the internet will tell you to put a profile section saying what it is you're looking for, what's going to make a good company for you. Um, and you know, even at the CV, I'm looking for somebody who's going to be that good team fit. Um, and if from the CV they can tell me that they're not, then it's in neither of our interest to waste our time going through the interview process trying to establish that they're not the right fit. Um, so try and be upfront about what it is you want, what it is you're looking for. Um, and then be honest. So, you know, the most hilarious anecdotes that I probably shouldn't tell are all about people who've just lied ridiculously on their CV. Um, and I can always tell, maybe I can't, maybe people have got away with it, but I can certainly tell in the really bad cases um, because there have been things where people have said, I'm Scrum Master for teams of up to 35 people. And you think, well, Scrum defines Scrum Master as up to nine or 10 if you're pushing it. Uh, so you've either done teams of 35 people or you've done the Scrum Master thing, which one do you want to choose? Because you can't have both. Um, and you've had people who have been unemployed and giving themselves amazing job titles at being unemployed, which is by far the best one I've seen, actually. Um, I was unemployed for a week. I was like MD of being unemployed. It was great. Um, and it's just anything where you're sort of reading on a CV and you go, you're what now? And you have to sort of go back up. Um, it's not going to slip harmlessly under the radar. And, you know, the best case is that it does go under the radar and then we have an interview and you're exposed for not knowing it anyway. So what's the value in lying about it? Just, just be honest. Moving on to phone interviews. So again, this will vary hiring manager to hiring manager, and this is just what I look for. Um, I'm looking for English skills. So as I'm pushing forward in the agile thing, um, communication's really critically important. Um, and I want somebody that I can just talk to and that I don't have to repeat myself to and that they can communicate with me. Um, and that it just feels like I'm getting on with them. It's a nice natural conversation. It's flowing well. Um, and then ultimately, are you worth interviewing? Um, so that's the next thing. I'm not really looking to make any decisions based on a phone interview. It's just a pre-qualifier to the main event. Um, and I start to gather evidence. So every interview process that I go through has an interview plan associated with it, um, where I'll write exactly what answers people have given to each question. Um, so that if anybody ever queries it, I can come back and I can tell them um, exactly why I gave the job to this person rather than that person. Um, if the recruiter asks for feedback, I've got it all written up that I can offer them. Um, and so even from the phone interview, I am starting to make notes about what's going on just so that I've got it for prosperity. So preparation is quite important in phone interviews. Um, so 
the, the first one is quite interesting, which is just don't be afraid to reschedule the thing. We, we understand, you know, you're probably working, you're trying to squeeze in a half hour to come and talk to me on the phone. Your boss tells you that you've got to go into this meeting that you weren't expected. It's fine, I don't have a problem with it. I've got other stuff to do as well. If you want to reschedule, just reschedule. It's not a big deal. Um, but I've ended up in situations where people clearly should have rescheduled and have tried not to. So they're sat in the office, they can't talk really, they're doing one word answers. Yes, <laughs> amazing acoustic sound. Um, but I just think, in what way was that better than just picking up the phone and saying, is it OK if we do it an hour later or do it tomorrow? Um, I, I fully understand that the people who are interviewing for me are human beings and have their lives. And you know, I've had people who are clearly on their deathbed, like really, really sick, trying to sort of cough and sneeze their way through an interview. I just think, are you really feeling like you're performing at your best today? Maybe give yourself a bit of a break and come back. Um, finding somewhere quiet, again, we've had people in the street, we've had people at train stations, we've had people, um, I swear, in a nightclub once, there's so much music. Um, but it just makes it difficult to communicate. And one of the key things I'm looking for is ease of communication. Um, landline is best. So I've got a crystal clear mobile signal in my house. Um, and I did a phone interview two weeks ago. And it just died in the middle of it. And I looked at my phone. And it had gone from five bars to zero for about two minutes. Then it went back up to five again. Um, but you just had to sort of break up the interview while the guy called me back, which was just annoying. So in respect, always use your phone. Um, look on the employer's website. Um, read the job specification, read your own CV, nothing catches you out like not knowing the things that are on your own CV. Um, again, this is just the stuff that everybody tells you to do. You know, every recruiter will send you a pack saying do this stuff before your phone interview. Um, and what's important is that when you're looking at the employer's website and you're reading the job spec, I'm not looking for you to become the you know, Jedi master of my company and tell me everything inside out about what's going on. I'm just looking for you to you know, spend half an hour to use a little bit of professional courtesy to look into the company that you might come and give two, five, ten years of your life to, um, which seems like the least you should do from a candidate's perspective as well as, you know, pleasing me as the hiring manager. Um, this is the really fun one. Read something about your industry. So of all of the questions that I ask people, by far the biggest bloodbath is when I say, so what's kind of new in your industry, you know? What's new in testing? What's the next big thing in DevOps? What are you doing? Um, and the number of people who have clearly read about us, read about that, but not really thought about their industry, their special skill, where it's going, what the next big thing is. Um, I find it interesting, because again, that's a, every list of interview questions will ask you something like that, like what's coming up, what's exciting, what you're interested in. Tell me about a blog post that you read. You know, nobody's read a blog post. Read a blog post, it's easy, there's loads of them. Um, and then I put question marks next to e-stalking the interviewers. Um, so some people swear by this, um, some people love it because it shows that they're so engaged and interested in you. Um, I have people turn up and say, sorry, I've read a lot of things that you've written and I go, cool, cool, cool. I'll just shuffle backwards in my seat. Um, it, I find it a bit weird and uncomfortable. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm not millennial enough to get it, but it just feels like um, spying or espionage or like they know something about me before they're supposed to know it. So, it's so I can see why you would do it, but why would you mention it? I think some people think that it shows that they've prepared really carefully and that they're interested in you and that you're going to be impressed that they've done all of their homework and researched you as an individual. Um, and I've had some people who've tried um, sort of talking to me about my um, about blog posts that I've written or about things that I've said on LinkedIn or, and it's just like I, I want to have a good conversation with you um, and I get that you're trying to sort of find another thing for us to talk about but it's quite a strange thing to talk about because I'll ask you plenty of points that you can elaborate on and we can have a good conversation about um, whereas this, and it it might just be bad luck on my part but it always tends to come really sort of out of left field like you kind of go um so what's the difference between an array and a link list? And they go, blah, 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 blah. By the way, I read this thing you wrote on it. You go, oh, hey, cool. It's, um, again, some people would love their ego being stroked that way. In terms of the call, um, this one was fun. I was sat there waiting for an 
interviewer to call and I was getting a bit sort of itchy about it and I thought I should write down on my list of stuff don't worry they'll be late of course they'll be late um, because you know what it's like they're going to the interview room the person who's in there before them's over running they're late um, they you know shoo them out eventually they leave they go in there's no phone on the table oh no I've got to find a room that's got a phone on it go and get a phone no editor put guy's phone number you know so it's very rare that you're called at the time you know two minutes later three minutes later it was fine in that case it was 28 minutes later and the guy called um, and he didn't call the recruiter called to say he wasn't calling um, but it was the nice sentiment um, say something out loud before you answer is a really um, straightforward thing but a lot of people will go off to their car um, or they'll lock themselves in their bedroom or whatever for an hour beforehand and read the jobs back and da 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 and then you give them a call and they go <coughs> and they go <coughs> Hello. Um, so if you can do all of the coughing and spluttering before I give you a call, that'd be awesome. Um, and then I've put answer with your name, especially if it's hard. And I get as a candidate, it's probably entertaining to hear me try and pronounce people's names because I'm terrible at it. And I have to sit on Google beforehand saying translate da, 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 and it'll plays me a little audio clip and I go Nye. and particularly um, my former colleague who was the tester was Indian and she just kind of mocked me about my pronunciation of Indian names because I tried really hard but I find it very difficult um, but when you think about what's going to happen when the interviewer calls you the first thing they're going to say is hello is that Dave if you say hello Dave then you save me a question already it's amazing um, and plus if you've got a difficult name I don't have to torture myself by trying to pronounce it properly um, and what normally happens or what often happens should I say is that I get it close enough and they never bother correcting me on it um, whereas at least if they say it I've got a good chance of getting it right in the first place I do try um, and just remember that it's all about getting to know each other so I just want to have a chat I just want to see that we communicate naturally I want to see that you're interested in us I want to be interested in you um, and in this thing when I originally did my notes I drew a lovely thing with three interviews like the um, gold locks and the three bears saying this candidate's too verbose um, but this is like the real difficult thing for me is understanding how to answer interview questions properly because you see complete extremes my record is 18 minutes of the guy talking continuously at me on the back of a single question um, and the difficulty on a phone is they can't see me looking at my watch going um, and yes, I could probably be a stronger interviewer and cut in and say thank you for that detailed explanation um, But I tend to just see how long people will go for because it's an interesting measure of their personality um, So that's not great, but likewise every question being answered with no yes How is that helping me to get to know you? Um, it's just really closed and it doesn't feel like an enjoyable experience for me It just feels like I'm kind of a quiz master on a game show or something um, so I think a good tip is to go onto the internet that's got these lovely resources of loads of questions that people are going to ask you give it to your mum or your sister or the next door neighbour and say ask me these questions and just time yourself and don't worry about what you're saying but just get into what you know a couple of paragraphs of answers feels like um, so when you're looking down and you go we did 20 questions in a minute you've probably answered too quickly um, and if you've answered one in 20 minutes you're probably going too slowly and keep on tweaking it until you feel that you're giving a bit of information but not too much information um, I've also put to be natural so a lot of people are really they see an interview as a formal big deal and they come at it with that kind of mentality and every question you ask they'll say thank you very much for asking me that you're very wise let me respond to you um, and I just go I don't really get you now um, so I don't want people to constantly be putting politeness around their answers and saying please thank you I appreciate it I just want people to talk to me just like a normal human being um, and then everybody says this but just have a couple of questions ready um, because I'm really interested in what you're interested in about the job I want to know whether it's the fact that it's in a nice place that you like or um, whether it's that we're doing interesting technology or whether you like the thing that we're making um, or you know 
a lot of people, let's be honest, they probably don't know a lot about it. They've seen a bland job spec that an agent sent over to them. The agent said, can I put you forward? They go, yeah, all right. And then the next thing they say, right, they'll give you a call. And um, I get that for some people it might be difficult to come up with questions. But even just, you know, you can have two stock questions. You can ask people, what's the culture there like? And then people get the impression that the culture of the organization is important to you. That's a nice thing. Um, you know, if you're a developer, you can ask, do you do TDD? And at least it's showing that you're asking that question. You don't need to necessarily think about these the nth degree and target them at an organization um, but really all you're doing is you're giving me a little bit more information about what's important to you and you're just keeping that conversation going a bit better so you do awesome at that and you get into the face-to-face -face. Um, and what I look for here is um, do you seem like a smart nice person that I kind of want to get on with um, and yeah, do we get on? Do you get on with the developers that I'm interviewing you with? Does it seem like it's going to work? Is it a fit? So, <laughs> there, there are, it's fraught with pitfalls, this thing. Um, try and go alone. Um, so, the number of people that turn up with relatives, with friends, with dogs, with. It's just, you know, I went back to try not to give me a reason to say no. Uh, it's just something for me to draw comment on, right? How was he? Lovely guy, bought his aunt. It's not really the first thing I want to be thinking about when I talk about you. Um, be punctual, so my emotion about people who turn up early has kind of gone in like a bell curve. So I used to not care because I was just turning up whenever I turned up and my manager was dealing with it, it was fine. And then I started being the guy who was responsible for the interviews and I used to hate it when people turned up early because I'm like, now there's so much pressure on me, like I'm not prepared for this. I wasn't expecting them for 20 minutes yet. And plus the room's not ready and do I have to get them a drink and do I have to keep them happy? Um, and the best case is that I just ignore them and then they're sat there for 20 minutes in reception, sweating, waiting for the thing to kick off. And it's like, this isn't in our interest interests. Um, so just, you know, two minutes before, five minutes before, be there on the time so that when it comes up in my diary, you've got an interview now and I walk to reception, you're sat there and that's really good enough. Um, dress sensibly. So this is, I think, becoming increasingly contentious. Um, so a lot of people um, or I think it's a way of telling you about themselves. You know, they're going to go in their scruffy t-shirt and their jeans because that's just who they are and that's the vibe they want to work in. And if I can't accept that, then that's my problem. Which is cool. You know, I respect that as a position. Um, but often, it's not just me, right? Like, back in the day, there was me and then my 60-something old stuffy boss who worked in Waterfall for 50 years and did things the same way. And, you know, that guy, I remember... We used to um, have like a lovely office that had a big semicircular window that looked out over the car park. And you could stand there waiting for the interviews and you know, survey them coming across the car park. Um, and I saw this one guy coming once and he was wearing black and red stripy trousers and platform shoes about that tall. And I just sort of looked at him and then looked at my boss and just kind of went, this is two hours, I'm not getting back, isn't it? Because you know, straight out the gate, there's no way in the world that guy is employing that guy. And he might have been very capable, he might have been a lovely guy, but he's just given somebody something to pick on by dressing like that. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to go suited and booted, don't go suited and booted, but just go to something where people go, it's an acceptable minimum standard. Um, I'd always say err on the side of casual because I like to run a casual workplace, but I'd be very surprised if I discriminated against someone because they turned up in a suit, because it's an interview. Like, people turn up smart to interviews, um, and I'm not going to blame somebody for doing it. I'm not going to go, you're not hip enough to work here because you came in a tie. Um, so, if anything, I'd go smarter rather than more casual. Um, and yeah, personality. So, I've had a few people who've gone big on the personality thing. So I had one guy applying for a dev team lead job who wore mirrored aviator sunglasses through the whole thing. And I'm like, I can't make eye contact with you because you've got mirrored glasses on. Um, and it's like, as I'm hiring you into a role where you'll be hiring people and you don't get why wearing aviator sunglasses to an interview is a bad idea. Um, I've had people that have really gone zany and out there with their, you know, particularly um, people who want to show themselves as eccentric and quirky and, you know, they wear the braces and the big bow ties and the, um, I quite like it, <laughs> but um, I might not. And it's just, again, it's just people sort of sticking their head out of the trench to get shot. Um, just keep it 
moderate. Um, and in this stuff, uh, of all of the things, I'd like to think that as an interviewer, I'm fairly forgiving and I get a lot of stuff. Um, this one's probably the only one that's like a foible of mine, which is that I really like a firm handshake. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Michael McIntyre sketch about limp handshakes, but he's like, what happens when two people with limp handshakes meet each other? It's like... Um, and I, I can't hack it. Um, I think my dad was a salesman and he was always taught, you know, in skills training to do firm handshakes and he's taught me that and it's like I don't have diseases, that would be okay and as much as anything else, again, everything on the internet will say do a firm handshake and it's like, well, we've not read the thing on the internet that tells you to do a firm handshake, it's just what you do. Um, so that's my kind of pet thing. Um, eye contact's good. And then remembering names, I have people with this over politeness thing go, thank you, James, I shall answer your question now, James. Thank you for the interview, James. But I think um, it's one of those kind of nice soft skills that you can kind of drop in. Like um, when you get to the end of the interview, you shake their hand and you say, thanks, James, really good to meet you, something like that. It just shows that you've got the skill of putting names to faces and remembering people and going that kind of extra care. Um, and again, it's all on the internet. So we've got to the reception alone. We've dressed sensibly, we're on time. We're going in. Um, I think of all of the cool things I've written in this amazing presentation, this is the most interesting, which is just accept the drink. Um, so you say, would you like a drink? No. Cool. That's the end of that avenue of fun exploration of your character. Would you like a drink? Yes, I'd love one. Cool. Come and walk with me to the coffee machine where we'll have some chit chat on the way and you can tell me all about why you love super hot black coffee and it'll be a riot. It's amazing. Um, so all you're doing by saying no is just sort of shutting down an opportunity for a bit more ad hoc communication, a bit more personality, a bit more, you know, you get to see the office as they walk past. You can have a look and see, oh dear, <laughs> monitorizers. <laughs> um, so that's cool. It gives you a pause if you need one. So if somebody asks you a difficult question, you've got a drink where you can go, you know what, I might have a drink. Um, and some people choose to do that as a super clever tactic that I'll never notice that they're doing it. Um, and some people are much more brazen about that. You say, uh, tell me this really difficult answer, and they go, I might take a drink. Uh, and then they carry on again, um, which I think is a smart thing to do. Um, this one is really good. It breaks eye contact. So the job I just started at, uh, my second interview was in a pub with the guy, and it's me and the guy. Um, and the guy's talking to me and I'm talking to the guy. Where do you look? Like, because I want to make eye contact with him an appropriate amount. But it's just me and him. So I can't break it and look at the other guy because there is no other guy. So it's just me and him and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, ah, oh, thank God I've got a drink. I can look down and pick up my drink and have a sip and then I can go back to eye contact. And that was lovely. Because what's the alternative? I can stare into the corner of the room, which doesn't make me look hideously engaged. I can look at the floor. Um, another option would be to do things with your hands. If you find yourself without a drink, look at your hands. So if you're given an answer, you can count things off on your fingers because that's complicated. You look at it to achieve it. <laughs> um, you can do... Uh, Oh, look, I've got some fluff, you know. There's stuff you can do to kind of break it up, but it's all awkward and feels really wrong, so just take the drink to look at. Um, and, yeah, it's this thing of just starting with a yes, you know, opening it up to a wonderful world of opportunities rather than shutting stuff down. Um, again, this whole porridge thing, be just right. Um, if you relax, that would be much easier because I ramble a lot. You may have gathered when I get nervous. It just comes out of me like spiel. Um, and... I think some people, you always kind of attribute people being really short and quite negative to being nervous. Um, I don't know if that's the case, or if it's just their personality. Um, but if you just try and relax and just try and be yourself, I think you've got a better chance of striking a natural conversational flow. Um, and back to the whole, please don't say please too much thing. Um, these are the really advanced tips and tricks. Saying I don't know is okay, because invariably if you don't know, I'll know that you don't know anyway. And you not saying I don't know just means you're going to entertain me a bit and make stuff up and I just get to sit and wonder what you'll say. Um, so I think I don't know is quite a graceful way of getting out of that situation rather than bluffing and trying to make stuff up and it's not a positive thing. Um, Asking the answer is okay too, so I think too few people do that. So if I ask them a question 
and they don't know the answer, they, they might say, I don't know, which is like a point. But then like, if you're engaged and passionate and motivated and curious and learning and problem solving and all of the good things I'm looking for, why don't you want to know what the answer to my question was? Um, so I'm not saying that I'm gonna mark someone down if they don't ask, but if you are genuinely curious and you, know, you want to stand a better chance in future interviews by understanding the answer to the question you couldn't do in this interview, then just ask what the answer was. Or, and again, it's just another opportunity for conversation, another kind of opportunity opened up to you. Um, Competency-based questions are something that are becoming increasingly common, particularly in large organisations. Um, and so, if you're not familiar with them, what they do is they take a role um, and either by a formal framework or an informal mechanism, they come up with what they think the main behaviours that you need to exhibit to do that um, role well. Um, there's one called Lominger, which is quite popular, um, and they're ridiculous things. There's like um, intellectual horsepower. Um, you have to demonstrate that you've got that. There's things like action-oriented. Um, there's like 80 of these buzzword phrases that you've got to demonstrate to do the job. And they choose the top six, and then based on those six, it spits out interview questions that they should ask to demonstrate that you're action-oriented. Um, and the questions typically are really evidence-based. So it's always, tell me about a time that you have, um, or tell me about a time when something didn't, or tell me about a time when, so they're looking for you to go into your memory and think of a specific occasion when that thing happened and you did something about it. So the things to watch for are that they're looking for you to have done something about it. Um, so if you answer continually with we, then people are left thinking, but what did you do? Um, and again, particularly when you're talking about Agile and that kind of stuff, we get that stuff's teamwork, right? If somebody was saying, I did this and I did that and I did the other all the time, then I'd be thinking, well, what were your team doing to support you and that kind of thing. So I think that bringing in that, you know, while Dave was checking out the code, I was doing this in the database, you know, having a conversation about that like it is quite acceptable. Um, but don't just make it really sort of high level and vague that we did it. Um, and there's a whole list on the internet of competency-based questions. Get some of them, practice some of them, because the challenge with them is that it's really easy when somebody says, tell me about a time that you did this. If you've done it, you'll get an example to your head straight away. But it might not be the best example. Um, and so you're kind of in this dilemma whereby you can have the thing pop into your head right away and say it, and then like, as you're saying it, you go, hey, I remember why this isn't a good example. Yeah, I shouldn't have, how do I change this halfway through so that it doesn't make me look really bad? And you end up not giving a particularly strong answer. The other alternative is to really think about it. Um, and there's only so many sips of water you can have. So you go, interesting question. Because it's one of those things, if you're trying to force to the front of your mind something that you've forgotten, um, or because you know, you've got that first idea that popped in there going, hi, hi, I'm here, say me, say me. And you're thinking, no, I don't want you, I just want to I'm here, I'm here. And it's really difficult. Um, so you really have to practice that skill of, if you can get it so that you've got a stock number of what you think were really awesome examples of you being a top-notch employee, then take those examples and learn them and practice them because odds on they'll fit into an answer that you can give and they'll be the ones that come to the top of your mind rather than just relying on your brain which can do very crazy interesting things. I mentioned before that I'm gathering evidence and I'm following a script and that's true um, but generally the best interviews don't really feel like that um, so in certain interviews um, it'd be interesting to sort of listen back to them and see this stuff in action but what you'll see is that I'll say Okay, and the next question is, and the next question is, and it's really sort of, it's just a quiz. It's me asking the question, them giving an answer, me asking the question. In a good interview, it's a conversation, and as they're talking about their experience, I'm flipping the pages back and forth to find the questions that I know that I'm going to ask them that they just answered in the experience. Um, and it doesn't feel to either of us like we've had a really sort of stilted, formal interview conversation. Um, it just feels like um, we're having a good chat. So I think that... Um, if you can try and practice the skill of, you want to answer the question and say something interesting that invites further conversation without answering the question and going off on a ramble about something completely irrelevant. Um, it's an interesting kind of skill to get, but it's just sort of almost leaving little sort of teasers of you're not giving them all the information and you're inviting them to ask you again about, you know, what was that thing that you said? That sounds quite interesting. Um, as with a lot of things, practice really does make perfect at these things. So this is the sort of fatality manoeuvre, how do you finish him? Um, so have a couple of questions ready, 
Um, again, this is, let's end it positively. Let's, because, do you have any questions for us? No. Okay, cool. So, I don't really, normally when I interview, um, certain questions, if they ask me and say, you know, I don't know, what's the answer? I'll give them the answer to it. But a lot of the time it is just sort of the information's flowing in the one direction. Um, things like the company and the role, I tend to expand around voluntarily. So they'll tell me the answer and I'll kind of cover off the bits that I think are important that they've not mentioned already. Um, that's like two or three questions at the top and the rest of it is just me, 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 me. And so I'm amazed if I get to the end of an interview, this is the last step, you know, if we do well here, I'm giving you the job, um, which means you're going to be obligated to accept a job and come and work here. Um, so think about whether you want to work here, what's going to make it good for you, what's going to make it bad for you. Um, so you must have something to ask, surely. It's an important decision, think about it. Um, and again, it builds more conversation. Asking next steps um, is perfectly fine. Um, say what happens from here, is there another interview? Just say what happens and I say, well, we're going to have a conversation, we'll get back to HR, they'll talk to the agent, you should hear in three, five days, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable question. My kind of closing thought is that I'm not a fan of trying to close the deal there and then. Um, and I kind of I went to town on this picture. Um, I, I drew me over here and the candidate over here and this whole bunch of people in the middle who are cut out if I try and make a deal with you on the spot. Um, so HR are kind of mad at me because they're trying to control costs in the team and I've just gone out and said that I'll give them top whack for their job. Um, the agent's pretty mad at you because the agent could have talked up another 5k and got a bit more money in the cut if you'd have let him out a chance. Um, and then plus it may well be that I can't even offer you a job anyway, I've got to get an approval or we need to extend the budget or we need to da da da. Um, and so I think that there's comparatively few companies now in which hiring managers empowered to go, deal, you've got it, let's shake hands and we'll walk out of here. Um, and it just kind of makes you feel a bit I'm not empowered to make that decision. Do I want it pointed out to me? Not really. Um, and it just makes it seem a bit sort of forced and like people are trying to sort of twist your arm. Because I've kind of got my process, I'm going to follow my process, and you try and sort of subvert that, it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, so for my money, just do the interview. If they want to talk money with you, by all means, talk money with them. Um, if they say, can you start on Monday, then by all means say, yes, I can start on Monday. But I wouldn't be the one to kind of try and pressure them and put them on the spot. And that's it. And then it's just like questions. Are you face to face or do you do, do, you do practice work? I, I find that I, I do better than you do face to face when we do like a small programming test. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, in pretty much every organisation that I've interviewed for, we do some kind of technical exercise, um, be that in advance before they get there, be that on the day. Um, my advice in those regards are to try and use languages um, that they'll be using in their job. Um, although, particularly for junior candidates, we tend to be quite open about what people can code in because they might not have experience, so we're going to train that, that's fine. Um, I think it's always better if you can provide a technical exercise that represents a problem that's a problem that you're going to have in that job or that other people in that job have faced. Um, so they start to get a feel for the kinds of problems, you know. Um, if they're going to be doing UI tweaks, giving them a challenge, which is a complex algorithmic piece, seems a bit bizarre, um, and likewise the other way around. So try and find a problem that's kind of targeted um, at um, the job that you're going to do. Um, and I think the other thing, I am quite a proponent of giving everybody the same test. Um, I think that in a sort of team building kind of way, it can become almost like a badge of honour that, you know, we've all done that test and we all got through it and so on and so forth. Um, also, you then can start to draw parallels between candidates quite well. Um, you can say, well, I quite like the way he did that, but if you remember how Dave two years ago did it, um, that was kind of much stronger and he had similar kind of experience and, you know, he was looking for less money and it really sort of helps to give you like a barometer where everybody fits relative to each other. If you do a different interview test for each person, um, you kind of learn something about the individual but not where they set, sit relative in a set. I had a question from a colleague of mine who couldn't make it today, <laughs> but she gave me the... Um, uh, the question, and actually, uh, it's something that you mentioned in one of your first slides about diversity. As in my workplace, we are trying to uh, broaden uh, the, the pool of people, uh, you know, their background, where they come from, because very often um, we don't have 
um, yeah, for a position, we might have one or two CVs, and very often uh, um, is the same type of candidate. Uh, um, so, so the question is, what what do you make? What do you do in order to make sure that you recruit people people from the most diverse pool of applicants? And it's not just uh, you know gender, but it's also you know all sorts of different. Uh, diversity could be in lots of different different things. Yeah, so I mean I think that as an employer you can help yourself by um, going out into the community, um, you know there's things like Django Girls and um, there's quite a lot of active Girls Do Code sort of um, things that you can go to to sort of try and address the um, gender diversity anyway. Um, and that's not a case of going in and cherry picking people it's just sort of you know making it so that when girls think about applying for a job they think about applying for a job at your company because they've sort of seen you and heard of you and that kind of thing um really i wouldn't say that i've ever um actively gone i'm going to hire you because i think you're better for diversity i think the best example i could think of um we were looking for a junior developer and we'd been interviewing for quite a while probably three months um and seeing people and not liking them and seeing them and not liking them um, and then on the same day, um, I interviewed two people, um, and the one was like a middle-class white guy, 30-something, um, perfect for the job, you know, he'd got all of the experience that we wanted to do, um, he was friendly enough, he was very competent, but he was just like another white dude for the team of white dudes, and it was like, hmm. Um, and then there was a younger girl came in um, who was really sort of energetic and bubbly and loads of different degrees and different background really interesting and we people are smirking uh, <laughs> but I kind of find myself in a situation of going well I kind of want to give her the job because I think she'd be more interesting and bring more value but then that guy is clearly better qualified for the job um, and so in that instance we just created another job and gave them both the job um, and that was kind of the best of both worlds um, with, with an honest view that um, if the first guy hadn't come in, then we'd have given her the job anyway because she was interesting and smart enough to have done it. Um, and it was just sort of bad timing that she happened to be behind another sort of capable um, candidate. Um, but I think that in all instances, it's just a case of having really sort of intimate awareness of your team, what it's like, what it's missing, what are the skills that you need to kind of fill in. Um, because you can then prioritize those skills in the job specification, which means that you're um, targeting people with a certain experience anyway, which often is a lot of the issue is getting the experience rather than the person behind that experience, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. So in the beginning, you were showing sort of the statistics for a year of hiring for you. It looked like of the, of the 99 real candidates you saw, you hired about 13% of them. Um, that, to me, seems like a low percentage. But, the, you know, we all have different standards. The, I guess that's really a roundabout way of getting to where I'm trying to go. It, how do you... Or what are your expectations for your partners in HR and talent acquisition and recruitment in helping to make sure that the candidates that you're seeing are, A, numerous enough so that you have a, a broad enough pool so you avoid the, the two candidate thing that, that was mentioned earlier, um, but also so that uh, the candidates that you have coming in it's not really their first experience with what your company is, what they do, what you're interested in doing, um, so that that 13% that can grow because you're starting with a, a better pool of candidates. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think the first thing is being realistic about what your expectations are. Um, because, you know, in a lot of cases, budget's done centrally and you're allocated, you know, what they think a fair rate for rollers and stuff. And you can look at it and go, that's not enough money to get me a rock star in that category. Um, so, you know, if I want to hire top 10% candidates um, and yet I'm paying, you know, top 60%, then th that's not going to um, work itself out. Um, and personally, I'm always um, of a believer that I'd pay the same money and get somebody with less experience who's more motivated, more ambitious, um, and going to give more to it um, than somebody who's got years and years of experience and is expecting the same money. Um, but I mean, 13%. It's interesting that I think about it and I think if I was running my own business, I'd want to say 
that I'm hiring the top 10% of people, maybe fewer, right? Maybe top 5% or top 2%, but the brightest of the brightest, the best of the best. Um, and you think with 13% you're doing that. And the reality is no, the reality is that that's just the people who turned up alone, who didn't take phone calls in the middle of the interview, who didn't bring their pets, you know, it's, the bar that I've set is just don't hideously stuff up and do the stuff that your CV said you could do and you've got a job. Um, and it's quite an indictment of our industry that that's enough to get rid of 87% of candidates. Um, so I think that, um, so that's kind of a answer to a question you didn't ask. Um, but I think the um, bit about how you make sure that you're getting quality candidates um, is a lot about engaging with recruiters. Um, so making sure that you're spending time with them, that they don't just get a dry job spec from you, that they've been to your office, they understand what it's like, they get the culture, they get to know you, they know what makes you tick, what you're looking for in candidates. Um, they get to know, you know, it makes all the difference in the world when a recruiter is the first point of contact with that candidate and they can give a real sort of heartfelt, you really want to work there, it's really cool, the guy's really nice, he's a good hiring manager, it's a nice office, you're going to like it there. Um, versus, you know, you take calls from agents who are sort of scrabbling around for a piece of paper going, yeah, it's a um, developer and maidenhead. And you kind of go, cool, cool, what's it like? It is a cutting edge and innovative working environment. And you go, yeah, I really want to go and work there. Um, so I think that getting your recruitment network to a place where they're actually doing a good job for you and selling it um, is important. I think that um, writing your job spec properly in the first place, um, if you do it well, your job spec can almost act like a job advert for you and you can highlight the interesting, fun stuff that you want to do. And you know, you almost make it, the requirement is that you'll be part of that cool and interesting, fun stuff. Um, because it's amazing, the, the one thing that I didn't capture in that that I might like to touch on is that people have come to interviews with me not having read the job spec and not even feeling a bit bad about it. Um, and you say, what do you know about the job? And they say, to be honest with you, mate, I know nothing about it. Your job spec is just one job spec in my big pile of 50 job specs that I've been sent this week. And if you're lucky, you'll employ me. Um, and... I get that it's a candidate's market, it really is, and you know nobody's having a trouble getting a technical job at the moment. Um, and I don't want people to kiss my ass, but I do want people to do just basic professional courtesy and just be able to answer the question when I ask it, right? Um, and it's just such a bad attitude. And so I think that, that's sort of, yeah, you sort of triggered me off on that, I thought about it. But um, what you really want is for the people who are coming and the people who are interviewing for you to be engaged with it before they get there because they know that it's a good company, they know that it's a job they want to do um, and you don't need to do so much of the selling in person um, because, you know, a part of the thing um, of what was it, 21 people I offered to, 13 accepted, that's because they take other jobs. Um, it's really, really fast at the moment. You know, if you sit on a CV for three days and get back to a candidate, they've taken a job. Um, and so you can't afford to dilly your daddy. You've got to get on with it. You've got to get through it. Um, and if you find yourself in a situation where you're in the interview and you're trying to do the sales pitch to the candidate as to why they should come and work there, they've probably already done interviews at other companies that have done a better job of engaging them earlier in the process. Um, and those people are probably going to get an offer out to them before you do. And as a hiring manager, you're really hard pressed to kind of be the guy that's engaging them and that's really going to sort of draw them to the job. Um, so, you, yeah, you've got to lay the foundation. You've got to get the jobs back right. You've got to get the recruiters on board. You've got to get your process such that it can be really slick. Because, um, I mean, you know, I've just gone through applying for jobs myself, and I started a job yesterday, and there are still people getting back to me for first interviews. You know, after I've gone and done a phone interview and two interviews and started the job, there's still companies that are still, you know, turning their big cranks and getting it done. Um, so I think that, it's that two pieces. One is attracting the right candidates, and then two is just trying not to let them wriggle off the hook throughout the process. And a lot of that is just about speed and just getting it done. But that's very difficult because we've all got diaries, we've all got meetings, we've all got stuff going on that we can't just you know, set aside all day every day in case a candidate needs to come into interview tomorrow morning. Um, but a lot of the times that's the case because you know the agent who spoke to them might not have got them on the day they are plus for people, um, try and get them to meet actual developers in their team. Um, one of the better places I interviewed at, um, that was just a qualifying round. So you got there 
Um, I think he did like a, one of those Belbin tests or whatever first. But then the next round was that they got like two of the developers to come in and chat to you. Um, and if they said, we think you suck, then that was it, you're done. Um, and that would be 15 minutes, you'd be walking back out the door again. Um, because it was that important to them that the developers got on well with the people that were gelling with them. Um, and as a candidate, I found that really good because I want to get on with the people that I'm working with. Um, so yeah, I think just trying to make it so that once you actually get a candidate, they are going to get energised, they're going to want to come and work for you. Um, and I think, sorry, this is a really long answer, I apologise. Um, I think the other thing there is just making sure that your company is attractive to work for, right? So there's a lot of companies that are still on 20 days holiday when every other company is offering 25. There are a lot of companies that are insisting people wear shirt and tie to work amazingly. There are people, you know, millennials in particular, they don't want to go to work in a tie, they want to go in jeans and a t-shirt. Um, and you can help yourself by just relaxing your dress code to facilitate that. You know, we know that people want flexibility, they want to work different hours change your organisation to enable that and you stand a better chance. And a lot of it is relatively low cost stuff, it's just cultural change um, that you just need to get done really. I think that's enough. I'd say on the 10 to 1, it's actually in recruitment or talent acquisitions, it's a golden ratio. So you're not far with 13 to 1, you're not far off. Uh, what we, we measure our clients on that specific CV sends to placements, which is a very important ratio. Uh, and 10 to 1 is quite aspirational. Which doesn't sound it, 10 CVs, but the one place, but as James said, the mitigating factors of those 10 people might end up in a position uh, that some of them external and beyond your control are there, really. But um, anyone that is a recruiter or recruiting for a business, I'd record that figure, uh, as you've done there. It's really important. Uh, we've got uh, had clients who <laughs> we end up being a bit picky, but uh, where it's 20 to 1, 25 to 1, 30 to 1. Uh, and that's when all of those factors need considering, really. Uh, he's, so. he's actually close to that number if you're talking about CB. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. He's 25 more. Yeah, and I mean, my worst role that I've been filling in the last couple of years, I must have done 40, 50 interviews for, um, just for the one role. And, you know, yes, at times through that, we've increased the money, we've changed the job specification, we've refactored stuff, we are trying. Um, but sometimes it is just that you've got that candidate in mind, you know what you want. Um, but the market just isn't full of really talented um, people at the moment. And I think what you find a lot is that if you're looking for um, people to come and do a job and be, um, you know, good team players, you can find people. If you're looking for, you know, really sort of the lead person, the one right at the top, the guy who's going to set the tone and lead everything from the front, there's just not that many people in the market who are capable of doing that. Um, so you really have to sort of dig in for the seed, really, and expect it to take quite a while, and hope that you know you average out on something else that's easier to fill along the way. But I mean, it's spirit crushing, soul destroying. You know, it's really hard work to go through the same process because I really am hopeful, and every one of those candidates I'm seeing at interview, I'm really you know, desperately crossing my fingers that they are going to be the one that's going to do it. Because who wants to spend 80 hours of their life? You know, that's two whole weeks of a year um, interviewing for a single role that we're not filling. Um, all the while, the pain that we're trying to fix is still there. Um, it's real tough. We are trying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, among all the people that you've hired, are there any that didn't work out? And so, in retrospect, were there any signs that you've, you've missed that you would have picked on with the experience? Yeah, of course. Um, and that comes back to the whole, if it's not yes, it's a no thing. So were there warning signs? Yes, because I came out of the interview and wasn't instantly going, I'm going to hire that person. Um, and then allowed myself to be, you know, eat. I do it to myself. I talk myself into stuff. Um, which I shouldn't do, but you do because you've got the pressure and because you want to get it done and because you can kind of see it. And I think that um, one of the things that you need to know is what your organisation actually is. Because I, I tend to view it as two things. I tend to view it as where we are and where we aspire to be. Um, and I think if you hire candidates that are too much aspirational in terms of where you want to be, um, then it's a difficult fit for everybody because they want to go you know all out there and do all this stuff and your culture is not quite there that it can be enabled so it's kind of frustrating for them they're not doing the stuff that you want to do kind of over here in the um, and that's kind of the worst ones I've seen have been where people have they've been really good people and in a different culture in a different organization they'd be amazing um, but they've just not been a great fit for where that culture is now 
Um, so probably if you'd have given it a year for the culture to move on and then employed that person, it would have been excellent. Um, but I've had the yeah the same sort of experience a couple of times, and um, I think the other one that's interesting is. Um, I was trying to do this diversity thing, right? So um, I had a team that was all sort of white, 30, 40 something men, um, quite sort of in their way. Um, and then I interviewed a team lead candidate that was like a young, feisty woman um, from Eastern Europe. And I thought, this will really kind of put the cat among the pigeons, you know? Um, she's got that kind of fiery spirit and she's going to shake stuff up. And yeah, we'll see what they make of this. Um, but what I hadn't considered in that instance is what happened if that energy was in the opposite direction. Um, so actually she came in and got on amazingly well with all of the nice white guy developers. Who went, oh, you're awesome. Uh, but this guy, he's giving you loads of problems, isn't he? And all of that kind of rage and fury just ended up pointed at me within oh, four hours of starting. <laughs> she started criticizing stuff, you're picking stuff. And I was like, oh no, what have I done? Um, and yeah, she was a very difficult manager. She had a lot of energy. Um, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, the developers all loved her because she was massively batting for them. Um, but a lot of it in that kind of leadership role in particular, um, there's the whole five dysfunctions of a team thing, uh, which says that your first team is kind of you and your peers and your manager. And then, you know, your obligation is to get the people who work for you to do the bidding of your team. Um, whereas she was definitely somebody that viewed her team as the people who reported to her and her. And that was kind of her posse. Um, and anything that me or her peers kind of wanted of her was um, in addition to that. Um, so I don't know if there's anything to take away from that. It was a learning for me um, that you really have to think about, yeah, all aspects of the personality um, and what happens if it goes as well as you think it will go and what happens if it doesn't. With great risk comes great reward and with great reward comes great risk, it tends to be. Oh, goodness. I think in the middle was fast. Uh, it's about the presentations these days. The companies ask you to present, but something to the so work you need and things like that. Sure, you didn't mention in your talk, but what sort of things it's good to include in that talk? They ask you for 10 minutes. You can't include everything you did for years. Uh, you can't be too technical. Uh, maybe you want to show diversity and all that thing. Yeah. What are the key things that I can sort of apply in mind to prepare that kind of presentation? So I can tell that you've seen my slides, and you're like, this is the guy to ask about presentation skills, which is good. Um, so I think what I'd advise to do is to think of it almost like essay planning. Um, so when I was at uni and used to plan essays, it would always be that you do your beginning, your middle, your end, um, and then within your beginning, you do kind of a beginning, your middle, and end. You kind of do top-down planning like that. So I'd kind of think about your 10-minute window and think, realistically, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to get into this to talk to them about why I'm here, what I'm going to say. I'm going to take a couple of minutes of questions at the end. So that kind of gives me my juicy six minutes in the middle. And what you want to do, um, you know, the industry is all about these T-shaped candidates, right, with a bit of breadth and a bit of depth. Um, and really, you want to try and demonstrate that in the presentation, I think. Um, so try and talk at a high level about a lot of stuff you've done. Um, and then dip down into something and show, you know, so you really want to go kind of top to bottom on a problem um, and almost be like, and then in this instance, this thing happened and I did this and, it, and almost kind of get down to the code of, and here's actually what I did. So you can show that you've got, um, there's actual code in what you're doing. But, you know, in a 10 minute presentation, you're not going to be able to demonstrate bits of software or show them your whole GitHub repository or anything. Um, so really just sort of do it as a snippet. And I've seen people do it quite effectively where they've, used code, but with not really any expectation that you're going to look at it, you know, it's almost like a kind of, it's there. If you want to come back after the presentation, we can stop and look at it. Um, but for the time being, let's accept that there was some code, and let's move on kind of thing. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think that's the only way to do it, because otherwise you can give a lot of depth and it feels like you've not got much experience and you're just talking about one thing um, or you can just give depth and you feel like you've only got superficial knowledge of anything um, so I think trying to mix those two things together and you can normally get a feel within six minutes whether it's appropriate to kind of go into depth on one thing or um, I've seen people probably in more sort of 20 to 30 minute presentations about their career um, that have kind of gone through a couple of jobs then sort of stopped and dropped down and then gone on like a bit more to kind of demonstrate as they're picking up different skills or different responsibilities um, 
And so things like, uh, I remember my dad doing one actually for um, applications into um, sales roles, and they used to sort of ask him about, you know, how he'd got these different competencies in. So the interview would be almost like a mixture of presentation and answer to competency questions. Um, so he'd kind of talk a little bit about his experience and what he did and where he went, um, and then say, oh, and in this role I demonstrated excellent leading ability as shown in this example, and then kind of talked on a bit more, and then went, oh, and over here I showed how much ownership I take for problems when any sort of, you know, just sort of nest them in there so you're getting that kind of answer into questions but with that continual flow of narrative I think corner question yeah I think um, I think for me I'm fairly balanced on it. Um, you know, as I said, when I'm looking at what I want, I'm looking for people with technical competency. It is important because you're going to have to do code or configuration or whatever it is you're going to do. You, you know, you have to be able to do it. Um, but at the same time. Um, I put a lot of effort into building my team and getting somebody that's going to work and be performant in that team and not upset things and stuff is really quite important to me. Um, so I'd say that the sort of soft skills and the more competency-based, and I'm not a huge fan of competency-based questioning. I, I want to get at the same information, but I think there are more natural ways of doing it, it feels, because um, particularly when they're generated packs, they're really clunky, not quite natural questions that you have to ask to kind of get the answer out of it. But I do want to kind of know, you know, how you respond under pressure. I want to know what happens um, when something really bad happens. Um, I want to know what happens if somebody asks you to lie about something. Um, I want to know how you've worked with other people in the team. You know, I, I want to know those kind of soft aspects of your personality um, as much as I want to know the technical thing. Um, I think in certain instances, if you're doing a presentation or something like that, you're given an opportunity to demonstrate your soft skills rather than talk about them. Um, so if you're demonstrating that you've got awesome soft skills, then you can maybe spend more time focusing on the technical stuff in the content. Um, but I'd, yeah, for again, it's everybody's going to be different, but for me, it's quite balanced between those two things. You said there's another question, or was that the same question? I don't think so. Um, there was a, I'm trying to think, there was a question on LinkedIn um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody saying um, that when they're doing interviews, they're looking to identify with the candidate um, and that by definition, they find it easier to identify with people who are like them. Um, so they find themselves kind of discriminating because they're looking for people they identify with. Um, and yeah, it was about the kind of meaning of empathy. So they say, you know, I can empathise with their experience. Um, and that's not what empathy is. You know, empathy is um, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and walk in them. Um, being able to put yourself in your own shoes and walk in them isn't empathy, that's just you. Um, and I think that people... I can see that some people would just be able to see somebody who looked like all the other people and go, hey, team fit, you know, cookie cutter is the same thing. But I'd like to think that in the first instance, I'm hiring people who could work with people from different backgrounds and different colours, different creeds, different religions, different, you know. I look for people who are tolerant and flexible and nice people. Um, and I like to think if I was in a team of, you know, all white middle something men and somebody employed a woman to come and sit next to me, do I think that I'm going to make that woman any less welcome in the team or that she's going to be any less an asset to the team? Of course I don't. I think that, you know, she'll just come on and we'll work together. Um, and, uh, yeah, but can we rely that the rest of the team will have the same mentality and no problem with the goals, for example? Is that it a concern as a, as a party manager? Okay, maybe. I think in the past that's been a concern. Um, and it's been a concern when I've inherited teams because people who've hired them in the past maybe didn't have the same criteria for hiring the team that I've had. Um, when 
um, I hire people. As I've said, I put a lot of emphasis on the soft skills and them being nice people and me feeling that they're going to welcome people into the team and get on and have a good energy and that kind of stuff. So I think that if I'd ended up recruiting someone who then turned out to be um, not particularly tolerant of people of different backgrounds or different colours or different races or you know whatever it is, um, I'd be really quite disappointed in myself that I'd hired that person um, that didn't make that person welcome, you know? Um, so my belief is that if you can do good enough recruitment in the first place, it shouldn't really be a problem. Um, and there is, I think development is still quite male-centric. It's still difficult to find female developers. Um, but as time's gone on, the number of women in and around teams is increasing. Um, so you find that there's um, a relatively high proportion of female testers now. Um, if you go to like the product meetups, there's quite a lot of people in product um, that are female. Um, you find that um, people in UX and um, marketing and all of those kind of things tend to be female. So I think as a sort of industry as a whole, um, it is becoming more varied, it is becoming more interesting. Um, and even if the developers themselves are sort of predominantly um, one-dimensional still, you're finding that the teams that they're composed into are becoming more interesting and diverse. Um, and so I do think that w whenever you're hiring, getting people that are going to work in that kind of diverse mindset has to be important. Because um, I don't want to work with people who don't want to work with people because of their gender, because of their sexuality, you know, whatever it is. Um, I want to work with people who are nice people who get on with everyone. Team fit as a, as a, as a term. So it's, yeah, I, when I was younger, younger recruiter, I used to say, oh, team fit, okay, yeah, I understand. I question it now. Have you ever had feedback where they say it was because of team fit? Always question and ask for justification about it. I go back to clients now, they come back to me and say, not the right team fit. Uh, I then go, what would be good team fit? Tell me about your culture. And generally, the, the, the feedback when it's not a good team fit, they can't answer that question. So if you can't internally create a culture and define what is a good team fit, then don't give it as feedback as well. And you'd be surprised how often when you get that as a feedback, it's a bit of a throwaway comment as well. So, and this is diversity aside, really. You'll be, if a company sits down and defines their culture properly, not for a marketing exercise, it generally comes down to we're fun, we're intelligent, we like getting the work done. And that's beyond any diversity boundaries, really. That's just human quality, to certain, essentially, as well. Uh, so team fit is a real bugbear of mine only when they can't define their own team as a client as well. So it's really important if you ever get that as feedback, or if you're giving it as feedback as well, uh, that you can define what your team is uh, as well. And until you do that, you shouldn't use that term, uh, essentially, as well. It, is, it, is it another aspect of diversity so that you can really pull things apart from different perspectives? If, if you have a team full of, as you said, 30 to 40 year old white men who are all middle class and all have the same degree, they're, the likelihood that they're going to see things the same way all the time is much higher. So if you have different personalities in your team, then they will question each other simply because they think at things, they think of things, and they they sort of consume and digest things differently than those around them. And that, in the end, in a team work environment helps you develop a more well-rounded, robust solution. And I think that's really what you're driving at, is, is if we get different personalities together, then we'll, we'll be open enough to, because they're able to work that way, we'll be open enough and, and honest enough and thoughtful enough with each other that we'll ask good questions, and, and hopefully in the end that will wind up with the best outcome. I do agree, though, that team fit is the worst, um, and I'm as guilty as anyone on that. Um, but it's also it's really hard to quantify. Um, and I try real hard, because I've got an interview pack, and I ask targeted questions, and I ask the same questions of everyone. Um, but then there is this kind of thing, when you sort of sit at the end and go, but do you really see it? Do you see him fitting in here? Um, and, you know, you're right. You know, If I wrote down my culture, what is it? It's fun, it's smart, it's intelligent. You want to go, sorry, we don't think you're intelligent. It's... That can't be it. It can't be. You just don't seem fun. Um, <laughs> you know. You know. It's. I think you described it really well earlier when you were saying that you had you, you had the the experienced guy who sort of was the mold with everyone else, and the young, energetic woman who 
didn't quite have the experience but had the energy. And so you created both roles. And, and if, if I take that apart and apply it to this, what you're saying is that you've got, uh, uh, you've got sort of a number of different personalities that might fit based on which role you're hiring, who you might be replacing, what the total team dynamic is. So the best that you can do when you're talking to your recruiter is describe, here's the team dynamic, and based on the roles that I'm filling, these might be some personalities that fit. But I'm open enough to consider a variety of them to see which ones plug in and, and play during the interview process. Yeah, and I think that because I'm, I'm very mindful of doing it because it's in no way constructive feedback for a candidate. You know, I've got it myself, not team fit. Right? What, what does that mean? You know, did I wear the wrong shirt to the interview? Did I inadvertently tell a racist joke again? You know, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's, um, it, it just gives you nothing. And so as a hiring manager, I'm always really keen to avoid just giving not a good team fit because it, it's just nothing. Um, but it it does take quite a lot of introspection and looking back at the role and back at the team and trying to sort of, you know, reverse engineer that decision in your head as to what aspects of their personality or their fit within the team aren't kind of working for you, which yeah, should then make it easier going forward to give better guidance as to the kind of people you're looking for for it. Did you have a question? I did. Uh, parts of it were, I guess, addressed, <coughs> but I'll ask anyway. Um, okay. Is there a suitable prop? or a somewhat reserved numbers guy at the CV writing stage. So I may, for example, look at my CV and it's bullet points. I think to myself, that's the best thing in the world. But as you were saying before, that might not be your particular style, I suppose. Now, there are other aspects where I guess and, um, you made a point about somebody coming in with bright pants, basically. That's somebody trying to express themselves. But if my style is predominantly trying to be reserved, is there any other prop like making a website or something to make that? Uh, so, I mean, my CV is a list of bullet points because uh, I think it's the most efficient way of transmitting, you know, a certain amount of information to the hiring manager. Um, there are paragraphs in between it, um, just so that it gives a bit more context about the company I was working for, what size it was, what I was working on, what technologies I used, that kind of stuff. Um, but it is bullet heavy. Um, and I don't think that's anything to be afraid of because it is just, you know, the way you're conveying um, information. People do try and inject more personality into what they're doing. Um, so, you know, there's that guy who's got like the whole Mario Kart or Super Mario level um, that sort of plays through and every time he bounces a bit of his CV kind of comes up and that kind of stuff. People invest a lot of time and energy in doing fun stuff and if you were working in a super creative um, funky industry in which that was very you know demonstrating applicable skills then cool go nuts I'd love that um, and to be fair if somebody submitted that to me as a CV I'd love it um, but I would question in most of the places I've worked with we're the right culture for them because I tend to work places that are a bit more dry than that you know um, I think that there's other tools that are available um, so there's I can't remember what it's called, but there's a site that makes a one-page CV for you. Um, so you kind of connect it to your LinkedIn and it scrapes all the information off your LinkedIn and creates like a profile page for you that's got kind of like um, infographics sort of stuff on it. So it's got like star ratings for your proficiency in different programming languages and pie charts showing this, that and the other. And, you know, it's a really kind of quirky or gimmicky, depending on your kind of take on it, way of just getting a single page fact sheet about you. And you do, between the two things, you get people who um, really tailor their CV. Some people have a photo of themselves on it and then like, you know, glossy sort of headline style narrative about themselves. And um, some people put lots of colors on it and nice margins. And, you know, people go to quite elaborate lengths to customize it. Um, what my view is slightly different in that the CV really is for two things. It's for search um, for the recruiters. Um, so you know, you've chucked it into the job site database and um, they need to be able to find it. Um, and so really the CV in that instance is about maximizing keywords. Um, so it's making sure that if somebody types in .NET developer, there's .NET and developer enough times on your CVs that you get relatively high in the rankings. Um, so what you tend to find is, or what you should find is that you use one CV for search, um, which is really just a repetitive list of buzzwords 
that would just mean that when a recruiter is blindly searching the databases, he gets your CV at the top of the pile. Um, and then the other one is the one that you actually want to submit through to the jobs, um, which really gives more information about you. But even in that instance, you know, as I said before, I get bored if you tell me stuff more than once. Um, I just want to see what you're capable of, where you've worked, what's involved, um, and really um, think about the information that's useful to me. I want to know which company it was, probably physically where it was, um, just so I could see if you've always worked locally or if you've travelled or what's gone on, um, the time that you worked there. Um, and what you did there. You know, that's really the nuts and bolts of stuff that I'm looking for. And if you can accomplish that in bullet points. I don't think, and again, particularly in the current market, people aren't in a position where if somebody's demonstrated the right experience and they've got the, you know, background that you're looking for, you can't go, well, but their CV was a bit boring, I'm going to get rid of it. Um, I suppose the only way, or the only circumstance in which something like that would be really useful is if you were going for you know, one of the jobs at Google or, um, you know, your dream shot job where you really want yours to stand out of the crowd. But I'd say that in most instances, it's just that sticking your head up thing because for everybody who loves your super funky new CV, somebody else will hate it. Um, and so I'm boringly middle of the road and just do something that transmits the information in a clean, concise, manageable way and people can read it, I think. I just add on CVs, um, PDFs, best format for a CV. Um, uh, is it Office Libre, Libre Office? It's very noble, uh, using a Linux uh, system, but it's got to go through a number of Windows systems, uh, just by nature of it as well. So, uh, And um, standard templates as well, uh, if anyone's um, used a Europass template CV, um, you will be one of many, uh, and you won't, you won't stand out as well. So there's a number of templates that are on Microsoft Word or wherever you create documents as well. Um, but try to avoid one as a standard template as well, because there is a an aspect. Before James receives a CV, there's, there are recruiters, and we're not as technically minded as James as well. Um, so yeah, we, we receive my inbox is about 80 to 85 uh, over a 24-hour period uh, as well. And you are in the hands, occasionally, not all, all the time, of, of, of a recruiter that is flicking through quite quickly as well. So as much as we try to avoid it and assess with a, a lot of depth uh, as well, there, you do need to stand out to a degree uh, as well. So, And just on key words, you're right, uh, definitely, we, yeah, we, it's no spoiler alert to tell you that we, that's what we use to, to search CVs and within databases as well. Don't worry too much about repeating. If you are a .NET developer, don't write .NET a hundred times. Don't write it in white and hide it in the background. <laughs> um, you, a, a good recruiter, will, if you're a .NET developer and you, you've got .NET and you've got ASP.NET or C Sharp written in your CV, you, you'll be found as well. Um, there's not hundreds of any part of the market out there as well. A good recruiter will find you, so don't worry about repeating. Equally, don't worry about putting tools on there. Don't put every database has ever existed uh, on there that you may have looked at once uh, as well, so don't feel you have to do that to be found. Uh, as a, an insight today, I had to do a search in Reading, uh, and it was just it was just Java, a Java developer that, with MySQL skills, quite basic. So in Reading, on the job site, which is one of the tools that we use, I got 25 searches in the last month. So that's not that many, so don't feel you have to stand out. I, w I look for every 25 of those people. So I'm not going to get 100 searches and you don't have to get to the top of that. You're going to end up in a search and you will be found as well. So keywords are important, definitely. You don't have to, it's not Google um, getting to the top of a Google page. Uh, you've got unique skills, I promise you that, and you'll, you'll be found definitely as well. So um, yeah, you don't have to write over and over again uh, as well. Don't you want to do white words on a CD? Is that a, is that a thing still? Um, not, that's the good thing about PDFs uh, as well, I suppose, and we can't find them as well. So, but I'd, I'd advise, get your, whatever your skills are, put them on your CV, and you'll be found for the job that you'll, you'll go for, essentially, I promise you. And I'll do it around. The other thing just reminded me of, I, I kind of said be honest. The other thing I didn't say, which hopefully follows on from that, is don't copy somebody else's CV. <laughs> um, which, yeah, is laughable, and yet it does happen quite a lot. And what you'll find is that particularly people within niche industries, you know, they'll say, oh, I'm applying for jobs, can I borrow, you know, 
their fellow consultant CV going to borrow it? And you know, if it's a list of um, technical stuff, like you know, if you, it probably is, or it may be true that you've used all of those things. But if it's quite a niche industry, we're only getting four or five CVs, and if two of them look exactly the same in the way the stuff's been described, then you tend to not think highly of it. So try and be all original in your CV creation. Is a CRM that generally, I think the market leaders are called ball, ball horn in, in recruitment, and uh, um, if I get a good CV, I put it into ball horn to check if there's anyone similar. I'm doing that because, wow, I love this CV. If I can find someone else similar. For that point alone, the 100% match. I thought, wow, found someone, oh, it's exactly the same CV. So yeah, you'll you, you, you be spotted uh, without a sound <laughs> well, because uh, yeah, there's some tools there as well. So uh, Luckily, the recruiter spots it and not the client, and we'll, we'll work our way around it. Um, but yeah, be, be wary of that, definitely. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so what's your position on false negatives in the interview process? Is that a problem for companies? Do need to clarify what I mean by that. Yeah. So, for example, like the easiest one I can think of is a lot of companies have discuss questions uh, like hacker rank or whatever. Some people are not really good at these. And a lot of times they have nothing to do with the job itself. And there may be a perfect candidate that matches all your, like, ticks all your boxes. But they are not very good at, like, when a timer appears, they start sweating, like, doing a door and everything shaking. Um, so, is that a problem, or does anyone quantify these? Does anyone think it's a problem? Does the industry think it's? Well, no. I mean, of course it's a problem. Um, you know, it comes back again to hopefulness, which is that I'm really with you. I want you to do your best. You know, I, I want you to blow me away in the technical test. I want you to blow me away in the interview, and I want to give you the job because it's you know that's what I'm doing. I want to give people jobs. Um, so yeah, if there's anything going on that means that the candidate isn't in the best condition to give a good interview, then that worries me, because ultimately it makes my job harder because I'm going to have to do more interviews to find the right person. You know, I want to give people the ultimate best opportunity to succeed. Um, so a lot of the time, uh, when we've done the technical tests, it's been a question about whether you give it, you know, in advance so that people can do it in the comfort of their own home without any pressure, get stuff done. Uh, but versus then you don't really know if they spent five days doing it or ten minutes. Um, and then, yeah, you know, it, we've done ones where people get an hour to sit and code something. Um, and some people thrive in that situation and do really good. Other people, you know, have literally written fish on the piece of paper and run away. Um, and I, I do get that. So I think that, um, and likewise, yeah, what's the point in knowing things that aren't real world? Um, what's the point in knowing that? Um, I can write a wonderful program that does something that nobody's ever going to do. You know, there's only so many times in the real world you use Fibonacci sequence, um, or so many times that yeah, you do Fizzbuzz or whatever it is. Um, and I think that extends beyond the technical thing, um, which is that I did a computer science degree, and I know um, you know a relatively large amount of the book work there about the theory of programming and stuff. How often have I actually used delegates in anger in the real world? Never, not once in my career have I used them. Um, so would I feel awesome if I applied for a job and somebody refused me the job because I didn't know delegates? I wouldn't feel awesome about that. Um, and so I think that in all instances, you sort of, you know, I've laid out my shop, I've decided what questions I'm going to ask, how I'm going to ask them, what the technical test is going to be. Um, but then it's a case of just moderating the feedback on that, which is, okay, they don't know delegates, big deal, you know, they can pick that up. Or if we ever decide that we're going to use them as a thing, then we can, you know, make that a point of investment. Um, so it's kind of one thing to, I think a lot of the time, um, candidates worry that we're expecting the right answer to all of the questions, um, which isn't necessarily the case. You know, we're firing a lot of questions, we want to know which ones you know the answers to. Um, and probably nobody's going to know the answer to all of them because not everybody has that kind of vast array of experience that would enable them to, you know, be an expert in the front end, be an expert in the back end, um, have done presentations to a thousand people, um, and you know, done technical architecture at the same time. It's um, you're looking for what people have done, where their experience does lie, um, and I think I, I'm always quite careful to try and make sure that the technical exercise is as balanced and as fair as it can be. 
Um, so, as I said earlier, if I think somebody's junior, then I'll accept them writing it in a different language because they probably only know certain languages. If they're really junior, then I'll just let them write pseudocode because they probably don't know any language well enough to write something reliably within an hour. Um, if I think is appropriate, I'll sit with them and I'll you know, offer them support and prompting through it because, again, I want them to do well and get to the end. The idea that I can say, when I offer this person zero support, they don't do well, um, again, isn't particularly realistic of what's going to happen in real life because in real life we're going to give them support and we're going to help them and we're going to help them to get to the right answer. Um, which again is back to the asking for what the answer to stuff is because I want to tell people that to make them better and stronger. Um, so yes, it's a big worry. I'd encourage any hiring manager to really think carefully about the way they're designing their interview process such that it gives all candidates the best opportunity of succeeding in it because if you don't, it's just in nobody's interest. It's not in the candidate's interest because they don't get the job they want. It's not in your interest because you don't get the candidate you want. Um, and it probably makes the whole thing more awkward and uncomfortable and stressful for people than it needs to be. Because, um, you know, interviewing can be a stressful thing. It's a lot of pressure, a lot of stuff on the line for a lot of people. If you get past the uh, CV phase, do you look at the um People's online profile, like look them up on LinkedIn, have a look if they have uh, a GitHub repo, are they on Stack Overflow? Um, sometimes, to be honest, it depends how much time I've got. Um, GitHub is moderately useful. Um, I think at a certain point, you know, if somebody's really active in the community, and they say, I do loads of open source stuff, and I've contributed to all these projects, and it's awesome. Going to their GitHub probably has some value to it, there's probably something meaty in there. Um, it's become kind of vogue now for everybody to have their kind of GitHub um, URL on their CV. Um, but I'd say a relatively large proportion of them you go to, and they've got Hello World written in four different packages, and then, you know, um, simple clock tutorial copied out word for word. Um, and you kind of go, it's probably harmful, if anything. Um, because before I was looking at your CV thinking, hey, you must be relatively experienced. And I'm thinking, so you can just do Hello World in React. Like, do I want to employ you after all? So I, I think um, if you've got something awesome to show, then try and show it. Um, otherwise, just stay quiet. Um, yeah, we looked at LinkedIn, but what are you going to look at LinkedIn that's not on the CV? And if it's on LinkedIn, why is it not on your CV? Um, Sometimes, you know, there's blogs and you can see what people are interested in and the stuff that they've liked and that kind of stuff, but um, I don't know. I'd, I like LinkedIn to an extent to stay social um, and I don't want to end up feeling myself that I can't go and wade into flame wars on LinkedIn because at some point some future employer is going to come and trawl through it and find that I have really strong views on clean coding that they don't agree with. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I tend to be quite neutral about it and maybe have a look, maybe don't. I, I don't think, well, I know that there's never been a hiring decision that's been made or broken based on the back of a LinkedIn profile or a GitHub or which doesn't happen. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you mentioned about the CV like every person might have a different, like, one might like the same CV and then might not. So, I I'll just take an example of my CV. I've kept it very brief. It's just one and a half pages. But what I've done is I've included where I've worked for, from the time, the technologies that I've used. I've not mentioned the details of the project because what I thought was it's better to leave something for the interview. I've mentioned the domain, like what all domains I've worked on, and the main responsibilities that I was doing. But I've recently got a review that it's too brief, and I am not much experience, I'm just three years old. I have three years of experience. So I thought, uh, what, do I need to include the projects that I've worked on? Because if we have their 20, they were like for three months, one month, but if I include all it would be a huge and Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so my CV was two pages uh, when I graduated, um, and it stayed at two pages until about a year and a half ago when I kind of conceded that there probably is more interesting stuff I've done than fit on two pages and now it's about two and a half pages. Um, but really what I did when I graduated, I bigged up my degree and my dissertation and all of my personal interests and stuff. So it filled up that page and then I had a job um, and I kind of concentrated on my experience in that job and technologies I'd used and that became like, you know, the first half a page and then 
the other two pages were kind of condensed into a little bit less, and then as the next job went on, I condensed it a bit more. Um, so generally, you know, every section starts being big and then gets slightly smaller over time. Um, and then I think this is the first time I've read on my CV and the job's actually dropped off because it just didn't seem particularly interesting to anything. Um, but I don't think, in the contract market in particular, you get a lot of people who think it's really important to list every project that they've ever worked on. Um, and so you can have literally seven pages of two month contract here, this technology, this domain, um, blah, blah, you know. Am I reading it? No, I'm not. If you'd just put a block that said, you know, 2005 to 2010 contracting various employers, including these technologies, really that would have given me the same amount of useful information, um, but saved an awful lot of paper and rainforests and stuff. Um, and I think that what I'd be looking to do is, you know, you've done a bunch of three month projects, which ones are those really interesting? Which ones are people going to want to hear about? Um, are there patterns that you can kind of draw together in there that you can say, you know, done five projects working in this bit and three bits in this bit? Or, um, and, you know, you've got half a page to play with, put some information in there, but don't do a catalogue of everything because it's just not interesting. Um, and I think it, back to the building a mental picture thing, I find it sort of breaks my mental flow about what's going on because all of a sudden it becomes an exercise in reconciling dates and trying to work out where they continued in employment for all of that time. And, um, you know, do I... And again, a lot of people don't explicitly state that it's contract. If it's contract, to say contract so that people get that you're not just being fired over and over again. Um, but I think that you just want to get across the, the spirit of the experience that you've got without kind of going into that kind of minutiae. Who told you it was too brief? Who told you it was too brief? Well, actually, did Yeah. So, um, I don't want to cast aspersions, but it's nice recruitment, basically. So you're, you're, you're right, your CV should be an introduction to the further discussion points. So the recruiter's job is to take your CV and go, that's interesting, you use that technology, tell me a bit more about it. And then they then say to the client, I've just spoken to this candidate, they've got this technology, this is something you want to do about it. I'd argue that that recruiter's not doing a job, to be honest, as well. So yeah, you know, there is a balance, it's good to get some information, not be too brief. Uh, if that, if that is what they meant by that, that's fine. But I'd, I'd argue that possibly want you to write everything so that they just go to the client and go, oh, here you go, which they shouldn't do. And that is rough, so. You want to make sure it does you justice, right? You want to make sure that every positive thing that you can say about yourself is in there so that they've got the best opportunity to get to know and love you. Um, but I mean, I've certainly had CVs from junior candidates that are a page long or a page and a half long. Um, and realistically, it says, went to school, went to uni, looking for a job, please. Um, and it's kind of, you know, obviously I managed it, but it's tough to spin that into two full pages of interesting content. Um, you know, as the experience builds, it becomes easier and easier to fill it up with meat stuff. But. Could I just follow up on the questions asked here? Well, I think do, do both of the guys. So, if you have extra stuff, like if you have a web page of your own or a GitHub repository, it's okay. If you don't have, is it good to start building up for future reference for future jobs? And if you have that, is it okay to back the city? Is that a good thing or bad thing? What do you, what do you guys see? I think it personally, GitHub repositories are important. If I, if I took a short poll or, or, or clients, James is right. You don't, you don't have to fill all the squares in. Um, that's, that's as far as my search on GitHub goes. So you can piece to know. Because uh, I can't, obviously can't read what's beyond it as well. So it's not volume. Um, but it, yeah, I hate to say it, but yeah, it, it's becoming important as well. But I think the, yeah, the ability to. There's two, two reasons GitHub is becoming important. Um, one is openness for sharing code, where, where if it's paired programming. Uh, which a lot of companies are doing, uh, then it's you should want to share your code and jump. Sometimes they judge it from that point of view as well. Um, and secondly, it, yeah, it, it's the, it's that passion for coding and doing it in your own time. Uh, it, it, to be honest, where you've got loads of time to burn and you think, what am I going to do with this evening today? I'm going to do some coding. Um, you know, you've got two options. You can go and try and find some 
irrelevant, bizarre technical problem that you can solve and demonstrate that you've solved it on GitHub. Or you can actually go and contribute to the community and, you know, help out on a library, build a project, do something for somebody real. Um, or, you know, build an app for yourself and stick it on the App Store or do something that's got, like, you know, a purpose behind it. Um, because you're going to work better when you're working on a purpose. Um, if you do it on a library or something like that, you'll get loads of people who will review your code for you, that will give you feedback, that will improve your quality. Um, and then when we look at it, we go, here's somebody who's actually engaged in the community, rather than somebody who's building, you know, just, because otherwise it's just you're doing stuff for my benefit, which I don't want you to do that, you know, do something for somebody else's benefit, for your own benefit, if nothing else. Um, and I think if you do want to then subsequently share that with employers, just make sure it's good, right? Like, um, because if you're exposing it so that people can come and interrogate your code and make sure it's nice, then make sure it's nice. You know, make sure that it's clean, that it's commented, that you've written unit tests for stuff, that um, when somebody goes and looks at it, they're going to go, cool, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and if you want to do um, practice, then do structured practice. Look at the coding cutters and that kind of thing. Because um, if I went in somebody's GitHub and there was like a coding cutters directory with like organized underneath them, all of the ones that they're done in today's, and, you know, I'd find that quite interesting because there's somebody who's taking a structured approach to improving the quality of their code, which I'd applaud. Um, but yeah, just doing simple tutorials and stuff, I don't think it's much value. So yeah, have a GitHub, but do something good with it, something meaningful, something that's going to, you know, improve you, improve the community, improve the world. Because otherwise, it's, it's just intellectual waste, isn't it? It's just you sitting up in your bedroom coding stuff that's never going anywhere that um, maybe one day might help you get a job a bit easier. Hopefully nobody's uh, like uh, looking at my uh, LinkedIn, uh, stalking me on my LinkedIn and then finding my old website that I haven't updated in like five years. <laughs> I mean, this is the the other thing, right, that you get better over time. Um, and so in the same way that your CV should kind of evolve with you and you should drop off the stuff that you don't want people to see anymore, your GitHub should kind of do the same. So when you've got really kick-ass projects on there, you don't need the really simple ones because as a hiring manager, I'll go and I'll click on two of them. And if they happen to be the two simplest ones that you did five years ago, um, then it doesn't kind of reflect well on you. So, um, But this is why I sort of... I, I almost resent the practice of looking at GitHub anyway because it's making it into a recruiting tool, which it isn't. It's just somewhere for you to stash your code, right? Um, and maybe share it with people if you want to. Um, and it's sort of kind of bastardizing that for a different purpose that it wasn't really designed for. Um, and again, so maybe if you want to do that, have a separate GitHub account that you use for your outward um, recruitment stuff and another one for just storing your things. I was just having, having a GitHub. Uh, account and being able to check into it is passing a few of those hurdles that some some people have seen as sort of yeah. get past. I mean, that's certainly true, and you know, you can read a lot from the people who've got personal projects that have actually checked into. Um, GitHub in the first place, you can see, you know, yeah, if they've got tests written for something that they've written in their own time, that's a really good sign. If you can see that they've used some sort of CI for doing it, then you know, all the much better, you know. Um, you can learn stuff from looking at it, but I'd rather not. There's a, I mean, I guess I would draw, a, a, I would draw back to something you said earlier, right? Which is, you have a resume that you sort of give for the, for the, all-encompassing. This is everything I've ever done, so that the recruiters can pull you up in their search. But the, when you when you get beyond that, your relationship as as a candidate with the recruiter should be strong enough that you should then go back to them and say, okay, based on the job spec that I've now read and the research that I've done on the company and where I am in my career right now, here's the version of my resume I want you to share with the hiring manager because that, that shows me in the best light. This is my initial advertisement as a candidate to you, James, the hiring manager. And and if there's something in your GitHub that shows you in that light, then put the URL there. Here, here's my, here's, here's the code that I want you to look at of the 10 projects that are in GitHub right now. Yeah. Right. And that gives you the chance as a candidate to say, here's my best foot forward for this role. And, and I think that on that, you've mentioned your point, which is just talking to the recruiter, which can really help you. I think that a number of people I've recruited over the years 
have been outside of the job spec or haven't quite been, you know, what I'd have said that I was looking for. But it's people who've gone to the recruiter and said, I really like the look of this job and I'll be up front. I can't do this part of it or this isn't really me. Um, but, you know, I really think that there's stuff I can add or value or, you know, I'm not experienced enough yet, but I want to be experienced enough. Um, and just them having that conversation with the recruiter who can then kind of convey that onto us. Um, because, you know, a lot of the time you've got a relatively fixed mindset about what it is you're looking for. But often there's wiggle room, particularly in this market where it's really difficult to find people. If you can find somebody today who's almost the right thing versus waiting another six or 12 months for finding you know, the perfect gold-plated, sugar dust, amazing candidate, um, then there's a lot of wiggle room for having conversations with people. Um, and always in that situation, it, aside from time, it doesn't hurt me to have a conversation with somebody and see whether, aside from the bits that they can't do or whatever, there's a good team fit there and it makes sense for us to work together. Um, so I encourage people not necessarily to be instantly dismissive of stuff. If you look down the CV and go, oh, I can't do those two things, or you know, oh, I've not done that technology they say is important. Because um, I think most employers are quite flexible about, you know, they'll have the mandatory stuff and then the optional stuff. But quite often the mandatory stuff, you know, there's wiggle there, you can work with it. Is that your experience? Yeah, I recruit their ops just in so they won't the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I probably spent the ages writing job specs, Jack, so I feel bad now, but <laughs> it generally comes down, you'd be, never be part of a job spec. Call, call the recruiter and ask them what they know about the job spec. They can't answer, then put the phone down on them as well. But yeah, it's, it's generally Linux and uh, they're a good, good, good person, really. So that's what we've got clients from, really, when it comes down to it. Uh, trust me. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that, you're right. Job specs, job specs are misleading. Um, so yeah, it's never. One day there may be a time where CVs just match job specs perfectly. But you people, people meet people. That's what it comes down to in the end. Um, so yeah, utilising recruiters if you do, or even applying directly for a, for a position, never be put off by a job spec. Always. Always go for it or dig around and find out more because there's always more beyond it or, or less even uh, beyond the job spec as well. And again, got, so, uh, yeah, got, sorry, James. So I was going to say, just for, in the same way, my thing had all of the people who aren't involved, probably those same people who are involved in writing the job spec in the first place. So I'll give a job spec to HR, who then kind of have their way with it, who will then kind of pass it over to this um, recruiter who puts their kind of spin on it to get it onto the site. And, you know, there's often a sort of Chinese whispers effect between what you actually thought that you wanted um, versus what ends up going out there or what the candidate receives. Um, and it's worth kind of bearing that in mind. So um, if you can kind of have the conversations and get the wheels moving to get your CV back to the source of that role, you stand a much better chance. Because um, otherwise, um, again, with poorer recruiters, you end up with the situation where they take something and it's not a direct hand and they just go, eh, toss it, I'll go and find somebody else, you know, the mythical candidate who is going to be 100% match for this job. Um, whereas if you can get that conversation and get the CV back, it makes a lot of difference. Good, good use of LinkedIn um, uh, is see a job spec and it's the senior software engineer and the company find that find the person that just left that job on LinkedIn. Uh, that job spec is that person. So oh, look, that person's just left me to replace them exactly. Um, if you look on LinkedIn you can see where that person was three years ago before moving into that position as well. And generally they work that person where they were three years later as well. So if you're applying either for a recruiter or directly to a position, uh, be cheeky enough to go I, <laughs> I looked on LinkedIn the person that's just left actually joined you three years ago and was similar to myself. Is are you not open to doing that again? Uh, and you'll be surprised again that they probably would be open to that as well. So that's a good thing, use of LinkedIn for that purpose as well. That's why you don't start reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I had a question about like uh, um, trying to negotiate uh, benefits. Um, so I came. I I I, I just. Um, went through the application process and stuff like that. And I had weird things like five hour, like getting sent a link uh, to a five hour test before I even got the phone interview. Um, and and people expecting me to work on eight hours, uh, on an eight hour project within my working week. Um, but I got to the point where I got to some interviews and everything was working fine. And then I'm, I'm one of these millennials that wants to have the hip lifestyle of, of a programmer. Um, and 
so I asked the questions. Are, are you doing uh, flexi time? Um, I came from a job that had flexi time, uh, so my my whole um, sleeping clock was adjusted to that. Um, and then I, I I tried to be super hip and say, can I do a day remote or something like that? And I know that's hard because that's not part of the culture of the companies. But how could I work around that initial? No, 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 we don't do that. Um. I mean, I suppose the fact of the matter is, if they don't do it, then they're not going to do it. Um, so, from, from your point of view, you ask the question, they say, no, that's not something that we consider. Um, and in the current market, with you know all of the startup culture and stuff that's going on, um, as an organisation, they're putting themselves at a disadvantage by being in that position. Um, <coughs> yet, nonetheless, they are in that position. Um, and what you're finding is that the culture you want to work in and the culture that they want to provide aren't the same thing. Um, so it seems relatively unlikely that something miraculous is going to happen that enables you to go and work there happily. Um, but what does happen is you ask the question and then me, the poor hiring manager that's been telling my boss over and over again that he needs to make these changes, that we need to modernise our workplace, that it needs to become a more engaging, nicer place to work, you know, I can say, here's another candidate we lost because wanted to wear jeans to work and we wouldn't let him. Here's another one that wanted a day with working from home and we wouldn't let him. You know, so it's, even by asking the question, you're helping other hiring managers to have that conversation. Um, I think that most places these days have a degree of flexibility about some of this stuff. Um, but what you'll find is that it's always contentious to change. Um, so companies that have been working a certain way for a very long time, um, it's a big change to say that you know we're going to enable people to work from home one day a week or um, yeah we're going to enable people to come in and go as they see fit and particularly in organizations where um, it's kind of like a mix of disciplines so we'll, it's quite easy for us to think in terms of our kind of IT bubble and what we expect but you know I've worked in places where there's been the IT team next to the customer service team and the customer service team can't come and go when they want because they have to answer the phone at nine o'clock and there has to be someone there at six o'clock to put the phone down um, and so you get that kind of jar of culture where they're kind of going, how come those guys are wearing different clothes than us and coming and going whenever they want? And so it can be broken down, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to break that culture down and enable change. Um, and so it seems relatively unlikely that on the back of somebody saying, can I work from home one day a week? They'll go, yeah, sure. Because you know, if they do it for one person, then all of a sudden all the other developers are suddenly working from home a day a week and they can't really do stuff on a one-off basis and you find that a lot again with the closing the deal thing you get a lot of people say well i'll come and work for you but only if i have 35 days holiday and you just go that's, that's just not what we do <laughs> um and the people in it if they're anything tend to be quite numerate so your colleagues will be able to count how many days holiday you've had and they'll discover that you've got considerably more than them and they're unlikely to be motivated by that discovery. So actually we'll probably just stick with our 25 days holiday that we kind of allow. But then again, some companies do make allowances for some of their employees. So there, there might be flexi time for certain people, but after like a certain level of seniority or after a certain number of years in, in the company. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the most common instance of that is building holiday with experience. So, you know, you get one day extra leave for every year of service or something like that. That's relatively common. I've not really had much experience. I mean, the places that I've worked, um, sometimes it's linked to probation. So they expect for you to be there for three or six months um, to demonstrate your worth before they sort of let you out to go and do your own thing. Um, but I don't know, I think that would be quite dispiriting for the junior members of a team, wouldn't it? If the senior people were allowed to work from home and they weren't, it would be quite, it doesn't sort of give that kind of flat, non-hierarchical structure feel to the place, does it? It's kind of one step away from giving them a corner office with a view and a mahogany desk and all of that kind of stuff. Anybody else come across that? Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering if, because I've not had experience of that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that I think that points to being clever about how you ask the question, right? Don't don't be in, don't don't be uh, too forward about it. Right? Uh, that one way that I've seen 
candidates sort of reach the topic? Because it is a nervous one, right? You're trying to gauge the culture, you're trying to understand, am I a good fit for this culture, am I a good fit for this company, are they a good fit for me? Um, and so, you know, one way that I've seen is, hey, are there, are there people on the team that work from home? Right? Are there people on the team that do remote work? Are you open to the idea of remote work? Um, it, it's, it, you know, timing is one thing, understanding when to ask the question, how to ask the question, um, having a conversation with the recruiter before you're in the interview is another way to do it. Because then the recruiter can ask it, and it comes from the recruiter who represents a number of candidates rather than from an individual person. Right? And then you can gauge interest before you even go. I mean, on, on that one in particular, I wouldn't be too afraid of it. I'd say that 80% of candidates ask that question as to whether there's flexibility around hours or flexibility for working from home. It's, you know, particularly in this industry with millennials, it's something that everybody wants. Um, so it's something that gets asked for the whole time. Um, so I wouldn't worry about, even in my super cautious, don't stick your head up kind of way, I think you're pretty safe asking that.